pair uh, Tidealista. It's like uh, a real estate directory. Uh, we have presence in Spain, Italy, and Portugal. I'm an open source software enthusiast. I'm a Pythonist and Django now. I've been working with Python and Django for more than 10 years. And I'm trained just to tame gophers, uh, if you know Golang. I have a real, a real hobby. I like to reverse engineering Android applications in my spare time. Uh, but I also have some normal, normal, normal hobbies, such as cooking and reading. And you can, you can just reach me via Twitter or, uh, or email at any time. Just feel free to, to send me a message. Uh, so I have this comic strip from XKCD. Um, it pretty much defines the problem that, I went, that we're going to try to solve. So it's about someone who builds a data pipeline, but if he's not sure that it's if it's going to collapse at any moment. Um, when I spot this comic strip, I, I just thought that this was mandatory. Uh, so I needed to add this to a, to a therefore talk. So in the beginning, there was cron. We might have a pipeline that we have just set up using cron. And here we have three different steps. The first step is, is some data gathering uh, process. And it starts uh, at, at um, 10 PM. Then we have uh, any kind of ETL process. And we assume that by midnight, the data that we need for uh, processing the input, it's already in place. And then we have a report step that happens and at 2 in the morning. And of course, we assume that uh, the ATL has, has, um, hasn't properly by that time. And OK, we think, let's, let's just uh, don't have that much, that much spare time, because we know that the gated data step just takes one hour, and we can do it in, um, much, much quicker. And we're just happy with that. But we need to check what problems could arise from, from that. So imagine that the second step fails. It happens. Now, we don't have any context about what will happen with the report process, because well, it will just not report, report nothing or just give an error. So we're not happy with that situation. Or imagine that the first step, the first step uh, takes longer than we expected, as we might be moving more data or whatever, and the process just takes longer, so it just overlaps with the second step. And of course, we don't know uh, <laughs> we don't know anymore about what the the, the two other steps, uh, how they are going to react to that change. So I call this cron hustle. So uh, we just think about using Chrome for automating everything. And there are lots of pro problems that we have to think about where, uh, while using Chrome, such as how do we manage dependencies between those, tax, those tasks. In the previous example, um, we have some, uh, sorry. We have overlap on the second example. We have an overlap due to the first step, first step taking longer than we thought. So we have to manage dependencies between them. If we need uh, the input of the uh, the output of the previous task to run our task or step, uh, we have to take care of that. What about the failure handling? What what if any or any of those steps fails? Do we retry the step? Uh, we don't also know how to handle error notifications. We, do we have metrics uh, from all those steps? Pretty much, we don't have visibility about what happens in each of those steps. And well, about unified logs, each step might be done by even by different teams. So we can just be safe about what, what will happen. And if you have 
uh, any time in your life, try to do a distributed cron. Uh, <laughs> it's just scary. So if in your team you are maintaining a calendar of batch jobs, and you're always asking yourselves, what happens if whatever of those uh, problems, every day is an adventure, <laughs> pretty much. So every day, OK, this, this process uh, has an error. And the next step or process didn't run OK because we lack the data, whatever. So you need to be careful. That was a good animation. Uh, so overview of Apache Airflow. Uh, it's a platform to programmatically and also, also schedule and monitor workflows. And pretty much is the glue that binds your data ecosystem together. It's open source. It's written in Python. And it was started in 2014 by Max Bookman at Airbnb. Uh, there, were, there were lots of really interesting projects uh, from that team at that time uh, uh, from Airbnb. You might know as well Superset. Well, there are lots of, pro lots of cool projects from Airbnb. I love them. And the project has been incubating at the Apache Software Foundation Science uh, 2016. And I, I, I think that a couple of days ago, I read that they are, think, uh, they are uh, kind of graduating at the Apache Software Foundation by next year. That's what they, they are trying to do. And it's a pretty, a pretty active project with uh, more than uh, uh, 500 contributors, 5,300 comets, and over 10,000 stars. And this was a tweet for, um, from uh, this, this past week that they were just celebrating that re they reached that milestone. And there are lots of really big names using Apache Airflow. You might recognize pretty much of them, of course. And what use cases uh, uh, does Apache Airflow serve us? So the, the main one is it's uh, doing ETL pipelines but we can do pretty much any kind of pipeline, such as machine learning pipelines, predictive data pi pipelines, fraud detection, scoring, ranking, classification, recommender system, etc. cetera. Uh, but any kind of general job scheduling. Imagine that we want to uh, do a DB backup at 2 a.m. in the morning. We could just use Airflow for that. Uh, even at, at lots of companies, uh, Jenkins, it's been used for that, those kind of tasks. So. Apache Airflow is, uh, is the best use case. Uh, but anything, we could even automate our garage door. So it's kind of an abstract way of uh, dealing with pipelines. So let's check how it works. Airflow is, uses operators as the fundamental unit of abstraction to define tasks and uses a DAG to define workflows using a set of operators. Hold on, it's, it's pretty easy, you'll see. So this, this is a DAG. It's a directed acyclic graph. It, it represents a workflow, which are a set of tasks with a dependency structure. And each node represents some form of data processing. And it does, it does uh, looks like, like, that, that, like this. It's, uh, in this case, we have a task. We, we then have another task called branching that depends on the first task. And then we call all on uh, any of those uh, four branches, and we just we just join on the on the last uh, task. But it could it could be uh, it could get really complex. It, this is our life example of uh, a really hard DAG with lots of steps. Uh, so, well, let's 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 make our first uh, DAG. So we we have three tasks that. Uh, has dependencies between them. We have one called print underscore bus, sleep, and print underscore python. And this is how it looks like using Python. DAGs are defined using Python. So we just uh, enter the DAG. We give the DAG a name. And scheduling interval, in this case, is going to run on a weekly basis. And then we just define the three tasks, uh, print bus, sleep, and print python. So uh, as you can see, the first, the first two tasks, are uh, using bus, what, what's called bus operator. The first one just uh, does an echo command, and the other one just sleeps. And the, the, the last one, it's a Python operator that calls Python, Python code, in this case. 
what, what this DAG does, it's just um, printing hello, uh, comic conf, whatever, sleep, and then print Python. And on the last line, we just, uh, we just manage the, de the dependencies between them. And we then have a, a nice Airflow UI. Uh, it's powered by Flask, we'll check it later. But we can see that he, there we have our DAG, commit underscore DAG. The schedule is weekly, I'm the owner, and the tasks. And we have lots of different links to introspect the task itself. But it could get, it, it could get really complex. In this case, we have a list of DAGs. Uh, we could check the schedule, the recent tasks. So we have pretty much an overlord of the, our whole data pipeline. Uh, we have lots of different views or ways to introspect our, our DAG. Here have the, the, the uh, what's called the graph view with the dependencies. It could be really complex. And we could just check uh, uh, what, what uh, has happened to any task. We could check the details of the task, the, the instance, we could check the log of that task at any time. We could just run it again we could just run that task again and all the upstream dependencies or downstream dependencies uh, or, or mark, uh, mark it as success or failure. We'll check it later. Here we have the tree view. So in this case, my ta the task that, that we have done earlier uh, has been running for four weeks and it went well, but we could just repeat it uh, from any point. This is a more complex uh, Tree view of uh, an existing an existing uh, DAG, and we can see, we could even see some failures in the beginning. And we have a really really useful and handy Gantt view, so we get to know how much time has any has any task uh, uh, been running for. In this case, uh, our sleep task uh, from the beginning took six seconds. Well, okay, some of us. So some of our heads there. But it could, it could be very handy, for example, uh, for longer tasks that have lots of dependencies. So we could see which processes are overlapping or if they are taking more time over time. So we could see how it's, how, how it's growing over time, any of our DAGs. Uh, so let's speak about operators. We know what's an operator already. So let's check which kind of operators uh, Airflow offers to us. We have action operators that performs an action locally or an external system as any third party. We have transfer operators that moves data from one system to another. Sensor operators, that, that's pretty cool actually, that waits for and detect any criteria and waits for it. We'll check some, some samples right now. So th those are action operators. It just executes code such as a Python function or a, it could just submit a Spark job. And we have lots of built-in uh, action operators such as bus operator, Python operator, Docker operator, email operator, a Slack operator. There are tons of them. And we have, the, we have lots of community contributed operators from big players such as Databrick, AWS, and GCP. Uh, we'll talk about GCP later. Transfer operators, so we could just move data between systems. Simple, moving data from Hive to MySQL or from S3 to Hive. And we have as well lots of built-in operators, Hive to MySQL transfer, S3 to Hive transfer, and community contributed ones. And this is the really cool, cool part, sensor operators. Uh, this is kind of hard to explain, but triggers downstream tasks in the dependency graph. So pretty much, it's a task that wait for a certain certain criteria, and when, that's, when that criteria is met, it just keeps running the rest of the tasks. So, for example, we could just wait for a file to be available in, on S3. So, if we have just that file on S3, keep keep running the, the the whole DAG. And so, we have lots of built-in ones as well: high partition sensor, HTTP sensor. We could call any external API and check for a condition to keep to 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 run the rest of the DAG. Uh, we have SQL sensor, FTP sensor, and as of, of course the community contributed ones, such as do we have any anything available at Google Cloud Storage, for example? That's already built in uh, by the guys at GCP. Uh, 
So let's let's do a, a, a really uh, more complex example rather than just printing functions and sleeping. Uh, so let's wait for a key uh, on S3 to be present on a, on a given bucket. Uh, let's create a new AWS Athena partition. Uh, Athena it's kind of presto as a service from Amazon. We could run a, run a AWS Glue job and wait until it's done. AWS Glue, it's a, a, a Spark cluster serverless offered by Amazon. And then notify uh, the team, in this case, Delta Services channel at, in, we're using Microsoft Teams, but we could use the Slack operator in case you are using Slack at your company. So we have already all the operators needed for doing, for doing so. S3 key sensor, Athena query operator, Glue, uh, uh, glue schedule job operator, glue job sensor, and Microsoft Teams webhook operator. Uh, some of them, um, I have write, write, write those my, uh, myself at Idealista. I, we're thinking about open source, open source some, some, some of those operators. But it's been a matter of a couple of days, just knowing how to implement operators and plugins, so it's quite easy. And this is pretty much all the code that we need for performing such, such tasks. So we have an S3 key sensor. Uh, we give it a bucket name, the key. And you might see that we are using a template system. So that template gets rendered on execution time. And all the variables are given on execution time. So in this case, uh, we have a variable available called execution date that gives us the execution date of, of that DAG. Why? Because, be, because we call uh, retry a task or a DAG in the past, and it will just give the date that, that belongs to. Uh, then we have the update row partition, the glue of schedule, the glue of sensor, etc. And on, on the last lines, we have the dependencies between all, all of those tasks. And I think it's actually it's pretty cool uh, to do lots of that such a huge data pipeline with just given that those. Uh, that those um, the, sm the small uh, uh, count of lines, and Airflow allows us to do lots of cool, cool stuff, such as imagine that we've been using Apache Airflow, and one of the one of the steps was an ETL script that has been running for weeks, and we didn't know until yesterday, but we introduced it bug a bug uh, three three months ago or whatever. Uh, so Airf with Airflow, it's really easy to just uh, log in into the uh, Airflow UI and just rerun, I call this time traveling, rerun the, the related tasks downstream. So we could retry, but we don't need to retry the whole DAG, but just the part of the graph of the DAG that needs to be run again. So in this case, we will just run the ETL step under children, but not the whole DAG. We don't, need, we don't need to do so. And we call this backfilling. And it's safe to say that if, if we uh, do our, our tasks in a side effects free way, we could just retry any task without, without having side effects. So I could just retry all the DAGs from the last three months, and I'm OK with that. So how everything fits together? This is the big picture. We have three ways of accessing or interacting with Airflow. The UI, it's a web server. Uh, the CLA, uh, the REST API, and all of these, uh, th these three ways of interac interacting with Apache Airflow. Uh, all, the, all, the uh, all the state of, how, of, of the DAGs, the tasks, the dependencies, et cetera, are stored on a metadata uh, DB that uh, could be anything from Postgres, MySQL, whatever is compatible with SQL Alchemy. And then we have a process that schedules uh, the, the, the DAGs and the tasks. Of course, the data is stored at the metadata DB. And we have just an array of workers. It scales in an horizontal way. We check, we, we check how, how this works. So we have the web servers that's written in Python using Flask. The scheduler, it's just a Python process who is responsible for scheduling jobs. And then we have lots of different executors. The most popular one is, is Celery. It's a, 
a, a, a Python library to run task queue, uh, 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 tasks based on a queue. Um, but we have lots of different executors. We could run uh, our tasks on a Mesos uh, cluster, and we, uh, the Apache Airflow project has uh, got a Kubernetes executor uh, lately, so we could just run our, our, all of our tasks in Kubernetes and the metadata, the metadata database. So the interfaces are those three. The web server UI, we have seen already how does that work, uh, the CLI, and the REST API server. So uh, we could just run any kind of command. So we could just start the web server, the scheduler. We could do lots of meta met, uh, operations on, on top of the metadata DB. We could just operate on DAGs. Then you have even a backfill command. So you could just backfill from uh, the command lines and lots of commands for, dev for develop and testing purposes. Uh, so the web server, as you might already know, uh, you could just have a quick look into DAGs and task progress, check for error logging. All the errors are unified at, the, at Airflow UI. And you can browse for, uh, the metadata. We'll check what's XCOM variables and SLAs, uh, what, what they are later, and check for historical stats. So this is one question that lots of people ask when uh, they are checking Air Airflow. How do we move data between tasks? Well, Airflow is not built for moving data between, between operators or between tasks. Uh, in theory, all the data processing should happen uh, in any other service. And Airflow only contains the necessary metadata uh, just um, for running the downstream tasks. So that means that we have to store on S3 uh, uh, the, the stage files that we need to run the next task. But uh, at Airflow, we don't store data that the next, the next, task, the ne the next task uses. We could just move the, the location of an S3 bucket uh, to the next task, to the next task that, uh, and that way, the next, task, the next task will just check for the data necessary to run. So we have this metadata storage. We have variables that those are static values, config values, API keys. We could just store them on, on the Apache Airflow metadata uh, database and, and use it on the template system while writing the AGs. We have, we have XCOMs. This is how uh, tasks communicate between them. It's just uh, a small JSON, perhaps, that you could pass uh, along between tasks. So imagine you have a sensor that waits for an S3, an S3 bucket to be available. Uh, a good example will be that that sensor returns an XCOM to the next task, uh, just stating where that S3 bucket has been found. And connections, we call the store uh, GDBC, GDBCs out. Uh, so we don't need to know, we don't need to, to store all that uh, data uh, while writing tasks, but we access it via the template engine. It does have lots of batteries included, such as failure handling and monitoring. So it retries tasks by default. It also could have uh, more complex retry, retry policies, such as backoffs. SLAs, that means server, server level agreements. So uh, if we have a contract kind of with any team at our company and, and we said, OK, this DAG is going to run for 10 hours, and that's the limit. We could get alerts if uh, service level agreements, it's called. If, if that, if that uh, DAG has been running for a long time and we don't comply with our internal contract. Uh, smarter cron, we could define uh, uh, tasks using cron syntax. But as, as it's uh, done in a programmatic way, we could add a Python code to check when, when the DAG needs to run. So we could add, uh, add complex code for even checking if it's an even, even day, an odd day, or call an external API to know if the market is open and we need to gather, I don't know, cryptocurrencies or whatever. Uh, lots of different complex dependencies, such as only run these tasks if the rest of the tasks ha have failed. Um, backfills, we already know about that. 
and a really powerful template system called Jinja. Jinja is the library using in Python, so if you know the Python ecosystem, Jinja now is kind of the de facto template engine. So I'm going to speak a, a bit about best practices. So what, what are the best practices? So uh, idempotency. potency, we'll talk about this later. Logs can be piped to a remote storage, so logs can be stored at S3 or uh, Google Cloud Storage. Back of retries, uh, that means that it retries, but it keeps adding more time between retries. And a good practice, at least for me, is to stage transformed data. So I could repeat any task, and that's not a problem, because the necessary data is already stored at, on, uh, at S3, and I could run it safely. Uh, without having to rerun the whole DAG. So res uh, recipes. So we could generate dynamic DAGs. Uh, this is kind of a hack, actually. So um, we, we, have, we already know that uh, DAGs are writing using Python, and Airflow, Airflow checks every Python file available in the DAG folder and register any DAG variable that, that is defined in the global space such as this. So in this case, we are just creating 10 DAGs uh, on the fly. So I don't know how many of you have been already working with Apache Airflow, but this is really cool. You could generate dynamic DAGs from a variable value, a static file. For example, at Idealista, we, we, we use YAML files uh, to create DAGs. So imagine that we need to gather data from a source, we have defined all the variables or all the metadata necessary at a YAML file and uh, lots of YAML files, and the, DA, the DAGs are created uh, dynamically, or just any external source system. And I, I'm, I want to, um, to, tell, to tell you about data engineering a bit, because I think that Airflow empowers data engineers. Let's check it. So does anybody? know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Cool, at least one person. <laughs> but pretty much is the, uh, we have the data science hierarchy of needs. And this is at, a, at a, some blog posts they call this the hiring, on, the hiring out of order problem. Because companies are focused on hiring data scientists and they just uh, have their 80% of their time, they are just performing data cleaning uh, etc. And there is this kind of new role called data engineer, and we need to care about what I call data literacy collection and infrastructure. And it's uh, a role whose mission is just to design, build, and maintain data warehouses. Data warehouses is a place where raw data is transformed, transformed and uh, stored in queryable forms. That means that we store the data, the data sets uh, necessary for the whole company, and any any uh, any worker at the company could just access have access to those data sets. Let it be the business intelligence team or the data scientist team or whatever. Uh, but pretty much our role is to enable higher level analytics with business intelligence, online experimentation, or machine learning. And we have uh, some key skills uh, in order to be data engineers. So we need to master SQL. So if English is the, is the language of business, SQL is the language of data. That's mandatory. Uh, we have to, to know about the best practices uh, when, while dealing with data. That means load data incrementally, uh, process historic data, backfilling. And as you could think, uh, Airflow allows us to do load backfilling, load data incrementally. So it's a perfect match for uh, data engineering uh, role, partition ingested data, and enforce the idempotency constraint. So, can't see the forest for the trees. What does that mean? That anyone could use Apache Airflow, but it's really hard to get what are the best practices uh, on how to deal with all those problems, such as idempotency, partition ingested data, etc. Uh, and uh, and th this is Airflow empowers data engineers and allows us what I call functional data engineering. That means that we have reproducible, deterministic, and idempotent data pipelines. We could rerun the task for any date. Uh, it should produce the same output. No side effects. 
future-proof bug-free lean versioning. So if we have introduced any kind of, bu of bug, we can just repair it uh, by rerunning the new code, either by clearing tasks or doing bug fails. And this is what uh, how a, a common ETL process will look like using Apache Airflow. So the extract part, we have sensors that wait for, that waits for data. We transfer it. We do some action on that data. It could be a, a Spark view, for example. And then we have any, another transfer or a, and a sensor to, to check if the file has uh, been processed correctly. Well, this is the same. And well, at, at Idealista, we have deployed Airflow uh, internally using Ansible. There we have the Ansible roles if you want to check it or you want to use uh, those at your company. But there are lots of uh, other options, such as Astronomer. This is a software, software as a service uh, for Airflow. And this, is, this was uh, a really big move uh, from the people of Google. They, uh, they launched Google Cloud Composer, and it's Airflow as a service, pretty much. It's a bit expensive. Uh, but I think it's it's worth. And the good thing is that they put lots of resources uh, into building all the necessary operators for dealing with the whole GCP platform. So you need to query, you need to, to perform a query to big query, there is an operator for that. You need to check uh, Google Cloud Storage, there is an operator for that. They have done all the necessary operators for dealing with the whole Google Cloud platform. Uh, what do we do at Idealista with Airflow? Uh, well, we do lots of different uh, stuff, uh, pretty much data pipelines, uh, data ingestion. And we do deployment beyond the Ansible role. We have developed internally plugins for dealing with AWS Glue and AWS Athena. We have developed, developed as well a Microsoft Teams plugin that's the same as Slack, but for Microsoft. And uh, AWS S3 to FTP sync operator. I don't know if we are going to open source any kind of those plug of those plugins, but uh, if you need any any of those, just ask me and we'll check. And well, this is it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any question for me, I'll be happy. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for this presentation. was was lovely, and yeah, I'm just working a lot with Spark, and I'm a little concerned how deeply can it be uh, integrated all these things of Airflow. I'm I'm not familiar with Airflow myself, uh, mm -hmm. and I would like to know if different operators could share the same Spark context. No. This, this no. I think it's against the good practice. Uh, to be honest, the, the, what I will do is, I mean, so pretty much how Airflow works with Spark, it has an Spark submit job operator. So it just uses the same uh, command line, Spark submit command hmm. underneath. And you can just send it to Amazon, uh, AWS, or GCP in case that you're using any, any of those. But uh, what I will do is just to uh, separate that into different steps and uh, save all the necessary data between those steps and on any intermediate storage such as S3. Yeah. And I think that that will be how that that's how I will de deal with uh, Apache Spark uh, using Airflow. Okay, great, thanks. Hi. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. Just a very quick question. Does it integrate with Apache Kafka? No. No? Thanks. I don't think so. I mean, uh, this is not intended for real-time real stream. This is rather more for batch jobs. Uh, but I don't know, if, if, if you just have a, a schedule where at a given hour you check for all the logs uh, that are at Kafka, you could just write uh, 
uh, a Kafka operator that retrieves all the data and just operate on top of that. But it's not uh, intended for real-time processing. OK, thanks. OK, so thanks.